Hello and welcome to this final part in the series of videos on grafting tomato plants. So in the last video I potted these plants on. Um, it's the 23rd of April today. These were potted on almost exactly one week ago. So um, these are in the sort of condition now I think where they they could be planted out. Um, it's still a little bit early here but I think looking at the weather forecast it's looking pretty good for next Friday so so in one week's time um, reflecting on the timings overall I think these would have been fine for planting at the stage they're in now so I could maybe shift the entire timetable by by one week say um, but they're not, they're not going to be in any, any problem staying in these pots. They're in um, one litre pots. They're, they'll be good in those for another week, I think. And yeah, they are growing away quite nicely. So in this video, I just want to talk about how successful it was, some of the things I didn't get right, and some of the things I may change for next year. So I suppose the headline figure is that 80% of the plants that I grafted survived and, well, and, and thrived. So um, eight out of 10, that's not, that's not bad. Um, I don't see why I couldn't improve that next year. Maybe, maybe 90% or so, I think. I'm always going to lose one or two, I would, I would imagine. Um, anything to do with the, the condition of the plant or a slight misalignment of the graft. And, and if it fails to, to heal properly, then uh, that plant is, is going to either fail entirely or then it's not going to thrive. There were a couple where the, the grafts had only partially taken, so they, they'd healed on on one side but but not the other and of course I've discarded those because I think in the in the longer term those plants aren't going to be good so the bottom line is that 80% um, of the plants I grafted um, appear to be doing well um, as I mentioned in the previous video I didn't graft all of the plants I had available so there are some varieties, um, those where I didn't have much seed this year, I would like to save some seed from those so I don't have to go hunting for it next year. And so I put some varieties aside, at least one of each of those that I'm interested in saving seed from, I put those aside um, just in case. I didn't want to lose all of the examples of any one of those varieties um, through bad grafting. And then there were some that I couldn't graft because I couldn't find a good match for the stem diameter amongst the rootstocks that I had. Um, so I've got a whole collection of ungrafted plants and then I've got another collection of grafted, I've got plenty of grafted plants. Um, I, I sowed so many seed this year that um, I, I'm really not short of plants so, so it's not a problem. And, and I was able to graft plenty of those, so I'll be able to fill both of my greenhouses with grafted plants. And um, those are the places where I really want the disease resistance because I've been growing in those greenhouse beds for years. And I will probably put some of the ungrafted ones in our new polytunnel, which you probably haven't seen yet. I say probably because I may have uploaded a video about it by, by the time this one comes out. But if not, there is a, there is a, a new small polytunnel there and that's going to get um, the ungrafted plants because that, that soil's never grown tomatoes before so disease resistance really isn't a problem there. And the ungrafted tomatoes are pretty substantial now. So I think they're going to do fine. Now when I did the grafting, I said that it was an advantage potentially to take the um, scion above the seed leaves. 
and I did that wherever possible and I ended up with a whole load of um, decapitated scions and I kept them for maybe two weeks after grafting just in case there was some kind of disaster with the grafted plants and, and sure enough the majority of them went on to produce new shoots from the leaf axils. Now these are the kind of shoots that you'd normally be pinching out if you're growing a, a cordon tomato. I've got rid of them all now. I just kept this one. It's only just been kicking around indoors. Um, just to show on this video really and, and show the sort of growth that has emerged from this specimen since, um, since I took the top off and grafted it. I think this particular one is a, a Saint Pierre and well if I if I did have a problem with the grafted plants I'd be able to nip one of these out and uh, this would grow on and produce a perfectly good specimen obviously a little bit behind these others and it, it hasn't really had any care so um, so amongst the grafted plants here I've got I've got three examples um, so this one is a, a Canestrino de Luca. Um, all of these, they all look quite healthy and, and I think reasonably vigorous. The Canestrino here, this is um, a slightly stockier plant. Um, I've noticed that with the, with the other seedlings of this variety. Uh, it tends to be a little bit shorter in stature than, than the others. Um, I guess that's part of its, its nature. I've not grown that one before, so um, I don't really know its characteristics yet. This one is red pear, so that's one of two um, of the large pear-shaped tomatoes I've got this year. And this one is already producing its first um, truss of flowers. Now, it, it won't produce large trusses because these are large fruited varieties but um, yeah they're looking pretty good I'd be quite happy to plant these now to be honest um, and then this one is pianolo so this is a small fruited variety it too is um, starting to develop its first um, fruit truss it looks all right it's um it's a little bit unusual because this is one of the potato leaf varieties, um, you may be able to see on the, on the uh, film there that, that the leaf shape is, is very different from the others. Um, if you're not familiar with the potato leaved tomatoes, um, you won't find many of them because the gene that results in that leaf form is recessive. So there are only a, a few of the um, they tend to be the older varieties that, that have that, that leaf form because as soon as they're crossed with one of the others, then that leaf form disappears. So it's always nice to have a potato leaf variety in the mix. I had no idea it was going to be like that, but again, that's one of the new Italian varieties that I've never grown before. So um, I think on the one hand, I'm pretty happy. I've got plenty of plants. The grafts, they seem to be reasonably good. Um, there are no signs of, of, of any problems there, I think. Uh, certainly not with, with the majority of them. And 80% success rate, I can probably improve on that um, over time. But I don't think that's too bad for a beginner. There were, though, some things that I got wrong. The big mistake was with the timing. So it's slightly tricky to determine exactly the best time to sow the scions, the varieties that I want to graft, relative to the rootstocks. Now, in retrospect, what I should have done was um, make a couple of sowings of the varieties, but I was pretty short of seed on quite a few of these varieties so I didn't really want to split the batch up. Um, I didn't really have enough seed to, to sow two separate batches. Um, but that is something I'm going to do next year. Now you could of course sow two batches of either the varieties or the rootstocks. 
But the rootstocks, um, for a start, they're, they're a hybrid, whereas, whereas these are open pollinated varieties. Um, but they're also, they're not that easy to get hold of and they are much more expensive than the, the seed for the variety. So it makes sense to sow the rootstocks just once and maybe sow two batches of the varieties. So following some of the guidelines I found, I sowed the varieties a little bit after the rootstocks, three days in my case, and that was sooner than um, many of the recommendations that I'd read. Those recommendations are probably assuming that your varieties are going to be modern F1 hybrids, whereas um, mine, with, with one exception, mine were old open pollinated varieties. So they're much slower to germinate and they are slower to get going. Once they're away, they produce lovely vigorous plants. So um, vigor in general isn't, isn't the problem. Um, it's simply that they end up behind the rootstocks. And that required me to delay grafting until, until those scions had produced stems of a reasonable diameter and then the rootstocks were much bigger and um, all, all of that was a little bit tricky. And so I got the timing wrong. And I think next year, I mean, this might, this might change between now and next year, but um, my thinking at the moment is that I would probably sow two batches, one, let's say four days before the rootstocks and the other 11 days before the rootstocks. So that is one week and two week before the date that I used this year. And I think then I should have, well, I'll have a better range of plant sizes, but I think I've got a better chance of having the, the top growth um, just that little bit bigger. Because of course these stems are, are tapered and you're taking the rootstock ideally down low where the stem is at its thickest and again ideally you're taking the scion um, further up uh, where the stem is at its thinnest. So that doesn't, that doesn't work out very well and it's made worse by the scions growing away rather slower than the rootstock. So um, I think an adjustment of the timing and, and two separate batches, that's gonna give me a much better chance of having more plants to graft next year. I won't need to graft quite as many plants as I did this year because now I've got a reasonable idea of the, the um, failure rate. So this year it was eight out of 10 plants survived. I could allow for, let's say, seven out of 10 to survive and calculate the number of plants I need that way and be more or less confident of, of getting a reasonable number. And as I will be sowing a lot more of the scions, I will have a load of uh, ungrafted plants spare again. So I think that should work out reasonably well. So the timings I got wrong, uh, and there was, one other thing that, that where I probably made a mistake and that was with watering. So I had read about this, so, so I was aware of this potential issue. Um, you don't want to water the rootstock um, shortly before you graft. It's much better to withhold water for a little bit um, before grafting for the simple reason that the, the rush of fluids up the stem can physically force the graft apart. So you push the, the cut faces together and they're held in place by a clip, but there's nothing really forcing those two faces to stay together. So if there's a pressure of fluids coming up from the, the rootstock, that can actually force the, the faces apart and then the graft won't heal. And I'm a little bit suspicious that I may have lost a few through that sort of mechanism. Um, I didn't get the moisture level right and um, 
the compost I was using was fairly light and um, I had to water it rather closer to the point of grafting than I think is ideal. So that's something I, I'm going to pay a bit more attention to next time. Um, make sure they're well watered but a couple of days before the grafting and then, then there won't be that um, rush of fluid after I've cut the top off. So one other area that I may have been able to improve on when I had both the, the scions and the rootstocks growing away and it became evident that the scions were going to lag behind. Um, it's possible that I could have improved that situation with better management of the growing conditions, um, maybe temperature, light, watering and so on. I could possibly have encouraged the the growth of the scion and maybe retarded slightly the growth of the rootstock. Um, it should have been possible for me to adjust adjust the, the temperatures and the and, and, and light levels to to maybe do that. And um, that's something that perhaps I, I should have paid more attention to. Um, I got to the point where um, so maybe a week before I actually did the grafting and, and at that point it, it was too late to, to make those sorts of adjustments and, and I should have been on the ball with that a little bit earlier as soon as I had indications that it, it wasn't really um, going to, to match up timing wise. Right, so those are the, those are the um, well I say mistakes but they're, they're, things, that, they're things that I need to, to learn and, and improve for next year. So as for the grafting process itself, um, I'm pretty happy with how the, the grafting actually went. Um, I used these small lengths of silicon tubing as improvised grafting clips. Now they worked fine. Um, <laughs> a few weeks after I'd finished the grafting, the actual grafting clips arrived. And, and so I'll almost certainly use those next year, but um, if need be, silicon tubing appears to work perfectly well. Um, so the grafting process itself, I don't think I'm going to change much with that. I would like to graft when the plants are a little bit smaller and it would be nice then if I don't have to cut away quite as much of the top growth. I'm glad that I did remove the top growth. So the, the scions had well, you could see four sets of leaves. The first two were properly developed. The, the third was um, much smaller, and then the fourth was, was just there. And so I removed, on most of them, I removed the first two sets of leaves. Um, not, I'm not talking about the seed leaves, but, but true leaves. I removed the first two, and then I usually cut half of the the uh, third set, so, so the biggest leaves away. And that just leaves a little bit of the, the, the top growth. And the reason for doing that was to reduce the amount of moisture loss from the, from the scion while the graft was healing. I think that worked out okay, but if I could graft these at an earlier stage, then I won't be lopping off quite so much growth and I would rather not have to remove um, quite as much as that. Um, but apart from that, I think the process worked fine and the healing process seemed to work fine. So after they were grafted, they went into um, a heated propagator where I could control the environment. So I closed the vents up and I misted it regularly whilst monitoring the humidity. So I had a little um, electronic sensor in there that was measuring temperature and humidity and that allowed me to control that environment so as the humidity started to drop I could go back in and give them a misting and that humidity is really important um, certainly in the, the first few days of the healing process. Um, that box was indoors um, but it was heated to 23, 24 degrees, something like that. So it had a warm, humid environment um, that was easy to maintain. I then had shade netting over the top of it so that 
um, it started off for the first couple of days dark and then I could slowly peel off layers to gradually introduce the light. And what I did for quite a while actually is keep it covered during the morning. So the position we had it um, gets direct sun in the morning and that can really toast things up in, in, a, in an enclosed environment. So I kept that covered and, and after the sun had moved round, then I would uncover it and, and I could then uncover it quite safely. The light level wasn't too intense. Um, so there's, there's quite a job in, in sort of managing the aftercare to um, sort of nurse these through the process. I'm pretty happy with how that went and I don't think I'm going to change um, any aspect of that. I was really nervous throughout this whole process because I had a horrible feeling it was going to go badly wrong. Within um, a day, day and a half, there were, there were a few that looked as though they were going to fail. And it turns out they, they did. They went on to, to fail completely. Um, but it was quite obvious after, let's say, a day and a half or two days, some had completely flopped and um, the stems were, were starting to dehydrate at that point and it was, it was pretty obvious that, that they were going to, to die. Um, then I think after, at the sort of three day mark, I'm, I'm, I'm regularly taking a census of how many of these plants look like they are going to survive. Um, we went from, you know, the majority of them looking pretty good to, I don't know, only a, only a third of them looking like they might survive. And I thought I'd really blown it. And, and it was another, another couple of days of nursing those plants, or day five maybe, when we took another count and, and all of a sudden, most of them were looking pretty good. Um, so that, that process of aftercare is, is, is quite involved. It needs a, quite a bit of attention to try and get these, get these through what is really a pretty brutal process. Um, and I think looking at how that went, I'm, I'm glad that I did reduce the leaf area of the, the scions because had I not done that, I suspect we would have lost quite a lot of the plants. So either I need to graft them when they're a bit smaller, or then I again need to trim off the, the top growth. Um, but apart from being apart from being a rather worrying time, watching these plants, spritzing them, adjusting the light levels, and hoping and praying that they're going to make it through. Um, that all seemed to work reasonably well and I think when we got to sort of day five or, or six at that point those plants that looked okay they went on to be okay. So I'm not really planning to change much in the grafting process and the healing process for next year. I will start them I think in larger cells so I, I started the signs and the rootstocks in 60 cell trays. That's what I had to hand. And I was sowing so many seeds, 180 seeds were sown that um, I didn't have space to start them all in pots and propagator space, of course, is, is quite precious. Um, but it would have been nice if I could have kept the scions in um, the cells up to the point of grafting. And that would have saved me potting on um, 80 or, or 90 plants. So I will move up, I think, to, well, at least a 40 cell tray, um, maybe, maybe even a 28 cell tray. And those cells are gonna be much bigger, much more compost in them. And I'll be able to bring um, rootstocks and signs up to the point where they are ready for grafting. Um, I would probably like to um, 
pot on the root stocks um, maybe three days before grafting something like that and I think that's probably easier to handle them when they're, they're then in individual pots rather than working in a tray. I mean, I've seen people doing that and, and um, people who are grafting hundreds of plants a day and, and of course they've got a great deal of experience and, and skill with what they're doing. Um, but I think for me and, and the way that, that I'm going to be grafting the plants in a slightly slower um, ploddy sort of way, I think they'd be easier for me in individual pots. So I will change the, the cell size almost certainly. Um, it worked out fine this year, but I had that potting on stage that at least for the, for the scions I could avoid. So after grafting, I can take any of the scions that I haven't grafted and, and I can pot them on into, into good sized pots but it would be nice not to have to pot on the others and that will help a little bit with um, managing propagator space. Final change that I might make, um, I haven't decided yet, but it's something I'm considering is maybe investing in some grow lights for next year. So if you think about a leggy tomato plant and of course it's dead easy to produce leggy tomato plants, um, you're sowing them at a time when light levels aren't necessarily great. But it's not a huge problem because with a normal tomato plant, you can just sink it deep. And that's even an advantage because you get them root growth from um, the, the buried portion of the stem. And, and that can actually be beneficial. But of course, you can't bury the graft union with these plants because um, if you get rooting from the scion into the soil, which you're almost certain to get, um, the, the graft union is very prone to producing roots anyway. Um, but if you get that root into the soil, then you're gonna lose the benefits of disease resistance that you were getting from the rootstock. Um, you might still get quite a vigorous plant, but that other benefit is gonna be greatly diminished. Um, but if you think about a leggy seedling, I mean, you've got, you've got the distance between nodes on the stem, so these positions where the leaves are coming out, that's all elongated. But it's not just that, that you're getting that height, you're not getting the diameter of the stem. So whilst they're growing a little bit leggy, it's taking a lot longer to get the stem diameters to the point where I want to graft them. So you can graft a, a little bit smaller, maybe one and a half millimeters, something like that. But, but I want to graft these, I think ideally at two millimeters. That will work, I think, that will work well for me. Um, they're not too difficult to handle at that size. Um, but it's quite possible that if I had these under grow lights, the plants themselves overall could be smaller and, and younger while still reaching the stem diameter that I'm looking for. And I think that could be quite a big advantage. And if I can better match those stem diameters, um, then I might improve the success rate just a little bit. So that's something to think about for next year. Um, I haven't quite decided. I can, of course, do this process exactly the same next year, and it, and it does work out reasonably okay, I think. Um, but I think there are, there are little aspects of it that I might be able to improve on, and grow lights might help me to do that. That's something I will think about throughout this season and, and decide, um, decide next winter whether I want to go ahead with that. So that's it for this rundown of lessons learned and things that I might change next time. I'm almost certainly going to do this again, unless for some reason these plants perform miserably or 
um, they all keel over and die in the next few weeks which is something I'm not anticipating but I mean if that were to happen I might abandon this idea but assuming these perform reasonably well then I'm quite inclined to repeat this next year so those those are the things that I might do a little bit differently it did look for well three or four weeks as though first up I wouldn't be able to graft anything and then it looked as though a large proportion of them were going to fail but in the end it's worked out pretty well so I'm quite happy with it and we'll see how they do throughout the year but that is it for this video and indeed for this series of videos so thank you ever so much for watching and bye for now